It's a normal Sunday, on the 28th of April, 1996. About 60 visitors arrived at the Broad Arrow Cafe near the tourist attraction of the 19th century settlement Port Arthur, Tasmania. The guests are too busy laughing, eating and enjoying each other's company in the popular cafe to notice when a young man enters. He is carrying a blue sports bag and a video camera. He places the bag down and unpacks something quite out of the ordinary. Suddenly, the patrons and cafe staff are now taking notice. Lone gunman, assault rifle, 35 dead, 23 wounded. Good evening. A siege is underway in the Tasmanian town of Port Arthur, where at least 25 people have been shot dead in Australia's worst massacre. Locals near the site cringed in fear inside their shops and homes as the gunman opened fire. Day trippers, holiday makers and tourists, young and old, massacred by a lone gunman. And some of the people were, were killed while they were sitting there eating. And they appeared uh, to have been taken completely by surprise. So he had a stare. Yes. He threatened to kill you. Yes. The worst massacre by a single civilian in world history. On one of our nation's darkest days, 35 lives were taken in minutes. It was the worst gun massacre ever. The staggering scale of it. One of our darkest days. Port Arthur is perhaps one of the best known tourist attractions on the island state of Tasmania. Located on the Tasman Peninsula, approximately 97 kilometres southeast of the state's capital, Hobart. Originally settled as a timber station in 1830, it became the site of the strictest and most secure prison in the British Empire. Only the most hardened of British criminals were sent to Port Arthur. It was thought because of its geographic location that the prison would be inescapable, much like the later Alcatraz Island in the United States. The prison itself was one of the first to be based on a new penal system called separate prison typology, sometimes called the model prison. In this system, there is a notable shift from the physical punishments to psychological punishments. Prisoners were made to wear hoods so they could not see anything and were ordered to remain silent for all hours of the day. It was thought that this would encourage the convicts to reflect upon their immoral ways. However, the lack of sound and sight caused many prisoners to develop mental illnesses. The prison was eventually disused and abandoned in 1877, with many parts of the building falling into decay. It was during this time that the idea of Port Arthur becoming a tourist attraction was being conceptualised. The site of the prison was auctioned off to different owners who wished to distance themselves from the dark history of the penal settlement and began destroying the property. A while later, the site of the prison became the town of Caravan. This was changed back to Port Arthur in the 20th century due to an increase in tourism following the popularity of novels detailing the lives of the convicts and the prison itself. The remaining prison site has been managed by the Port Arthur Historic Site Management Authority since 1987 and attracts 250,000 visitors each year. It was in 1996 when the site became known for Australia's darkest tragedy, a killing spree perpetrated by a lone gunman. 35 people lost their lives and another 23 were wounded. Today, the motives of the killer are not quite clear and have been the subject of debate for over 25 years. Before we go on, I would like to acknowledge the fact that this video topic is a sensitive subject for some. If you're not comfortable hearing any of the details, then please use discretion. Likewise, for those posting in the comments, remember to keep them respectful, as you never know who could be watching this. This video is intended for educational and historical purposes and is in no way intended to upset or cause disrespect to the victim's loved ones. It has recently been brought to my attention that some of the sources online and different media choose to omit the killer's name from their writings and productions. Most likely, this is due to a statement made by the killer to a psychiatrist after the massacre took place, in which he states that his intentions were for revenge and notoriety. I struggled with his moral dilemma before realising that any newspaper article and current affairs program would have included this knowledge anyhow, and most people would already probably know his name. Not only that, but as you'll later see, he gave multiple and contradictory reasons for his actions that day.
I tried, I broke the stick trying to get out, but I couldn't, and it made the whole thing like jeans. You'll be in here for a while longer, won't you? Yeah, about a week. Do you think you'll be playing with firecrackers anymore? Yes. Don't you think you've learned a lesson from this? Yes, but I'm still playing with it. Martin John Bryant was born on May the 7th, 1967 in Hobart, Tasmania. The first child of Morris and Carlene Bryant and grew up for some time in Carnarvon Bay. Described by many as an odd and unaffectionate child, Bryant would constantly be in trouble at home or in school. His mother described him as an annoying and different child and made many remarks that she shied away from cuddling or any physical affection. Young Martin would have a habit of running away from his mother and disrupting the quiet family daily. As a last resort, Carlene had to secure a harness and leash to young toddler Martin to keep him from escaping the property. At school, Martin's teachers describe him as displaying strange behaviour, unemotional and distant from reality. Bryant was frequently bullied and even caused a lot of trouble himself. One instance saw him pulling a snorkel away from another boy when they were diving. After being suspended from his primary school in Newtown, a psychological assessment was done on Martin and some noticeable red flags were found. He liked to bully smaller children and torture animals. In 1980, Martin was placed in the special education unit in Newtown High School, where it is said in multiple sources that he suffered educationally and his behaviour became even worse. Often recounted was Martin's lack of social skills and inappropriate behaviour and his attempts to make friends by jumping on other schoolmates unawares further exacerbated his status as the social pariah. At the age of 14, Martin's father Morris gifted him an air rifle. Martin would frequently use this air rifle to cause trouble around his neighbourhood. It's been reported that he used it to shoot at traffic from a long distance and one time allegedly to kill parrots. In 1983, Martin left school just before he turned 16. A year later, the Bryants took their son to be evaluated by the state for a disability pension. The psychiatrist did not take long to realise there was a noticeable problem with Martin. Unable to concentrate on the doctor's conversation and frequently interrupting the doctor to talk about the age of the house and the fireplace in the room. After a few more visits, the doctor deemed Martin unemployable as he would annoy and aggravate co-workers to the point where he would always be in trouble and would have to be on a disability pension. A further assessment gave a dire warning. It reads, cannot read or write, does a bit of gardening and watches TV. Only his parents' efforts that prevent further deterioration could be schizophrenic and parents face a bleak future with him. Tonight's Tats Lotto Draw is brought to you by East West Airlines, making the good times possible. Hi everybody, welcome to the Midweek Draw, the big one on Wednesday. Draw number 946 of the Australian Lotto Block. Of course, our officials are here tonight, but it's our Tats Rips. Under the constant and meticulous supervision of his father, Morris, the three years following his departure from the school systems were rather uneventful. Martin's father's desire to normalise the boy was met with some challenges around the home. And by this time, Carlene had largely given up trying to connect with Martin in a normal mother-son relationship. It was in 1987 when Martin met the heiress to the Tattersall's gambling empire, Helen Harvey. It was through Martin's handyman and lawn care services that the two met when Harvey employed the young odd man. Helen Harvey lived with her elderly mother in a neglected 325 square metre two-storey Art Deco family home in Newtown. Helen did work a normal office job in Tasmanian Railways, but at the age of 28, after the premature death of her father, quit to spend the rest of her life with her mother in the imposing family home. By the mid-1980s, both women were virtually recluses. According to the local shopkeepers in Newtown, Helen was a bit of an eccentric, a larger woman with some missing teeth and a penchant for old-fashioned clothes that were desperate for a wash. Amongst her many eccentricities were the stories she told of her Hollywood friends, which included the likes of Errol Flynn and Rock Hudson. It was one day in early 1987 when Martin Bryant met Helen Harvey during one of his routine walks around the neighborhood, looking for new customers for his lawn mowing and gardening business. Martin spotted the neglected gardens and overgrown lawn through the iron gates of the Harvey's family home in Newtown walked right up to the front door and began chatting with Helen. 
Immediately, a friendship was born. Helen hired Martin to take care of the gardens and lawns and added pet care to his many responsibilities. The house was two-storied, but the 14 dogs had rule of the first floor, while the 40-odd cats lived out in the garage. Over the next few years, Martin continued to work for Helen and the two formed a bond that spilled over past the lines of an employee-employer relationship. Although Martin would later state that it was not a sexual relationship in nature, others around the community thought the friendship was quite odd. In June of 1990, an unknown person reported the state of the house and the deteriorating health of Helen's mother to the health authorities. Medics arrived to find the elderly mother and Helen in need of urgent hospital treatment with infected leg ulcers and living in squalor in the kitchen, surrounded not only by roaming animals, but unwashed dishes and saucepans and bowls with mould so high it was climbing out of the oven. Helen's mother was found in an extremely bad state of neglect. She was found sitting in a chair in the kitchen with an unattended broken hip that she had been complaining about for a while. RSPCA took away most of the animals living at the property, and Helen and her mother were both taken to hospital. Helen's 79-year-old mother died a month later at the end of July. A mandatory cleanup was ordered, and Martin and his father Morris both took it upon themselves to clean the property up. Reports from various people state that the cleanup took around three months. After Helen recovered and returned from hospital, Martin moved in with Helen as her live-in companion, and they moved to the small town of Copping. The two would often wander the streets together, visiting various shops and spending extravagant amounts of money. Most of the time, they would spend up large on an extraordinary amount of cars, sometimes only keeping them for a matter of weeks. It was noticed by his father during this time that Martin's mood began darkening, despite his newfound friendship with Helen and the amount that she spoiled him. His behavior also became worse. The once stupid childlike pranks gave way to violent threats, and he became very quick to anger. Another psychiatric assessment was made on Martin during this time that details his emotions and behaviors at the time also with another dire warning. Quote, Father protects him from any occasion which might upset him as he continually threatens violence. Martin tells me he would like to go around shooting people. It would be unsafe to allow Martin out of his parents' control. End quote. Morris believed that without his care, Martin would not know how to cope with everyday life and quickly fired a will with the public trustee's office. The document stated that in the event of his death, his son would find it hard to manage life and Martin would inherit his father's superannuation, which was calculated to be $250,000. Morris and Helen must have been on the same page regarding Martin's future, because less than a month later, Helen would also file a will that would name Morris Bryant as the trustee of her will and Martin Bryant as the sole beneficiary of her family's Tattersall's fortune, including the numerous properties and livestock she owned at the time. Helen's will also stated that the inheritance would go to, quote, my friend Martin Bryant for his own absolute use and benefit, end quote. Within the small town of Copping, locals had come to fear Bryant, who would often wander the property and neighborhood at night with his air rifle, firing at neighbors' dogs who would bark at him. Occasionally, he would also fire his rifle at tourists who stopped to buy apples at a local stall. His dress sense changed too. In the past, he often wore white overalls with a cardigan, but now he was dressing more eccentrically. He was described as a country squire, wearing a grey linen suit, lizard skin shoes, complete with the accessories of a cravat and a Panama hat. The odd couple's presence in the town of Copping only furthered their ostracization from the locals, who thought it peculiar that they would leave cats, dogs, and even ponies in the back seat of their car while they shopped around town. The rare visitor to their property in Copping would also note their eccentric habit of leaving cash in strange places such as ice cream containers, or even just rolled up on the floors as if carelessly forgotten about. Despite their extremely odd relationship, the two were almost perfect companions for one another. It was, however, Martin's habit of being a reckless and dangerous passenger in the car that would ultimately end their relationship for good. Martin had a bit of a habit of lunging at the car steering wheel whenever Helen was driving. There was never a thought of danger that crossed into Martin's mind. It was more like a childlike stupidity or a harmless prank to him. It was for this reason that Helen never drove along the country lanes above 60 kilometers. 
Twice there had already been mishaps with his silly impulses that he seemed not to be able to suppress. The real danger was the fact that Martin could not understand the severity of his actions. In October of 1992, Helen Harvey was found dead in her car outside of the town of Copping. The car had veered into oncoming traffic on the wrong side of the road. The impact of the crash had snapped her neck, instantly killing her. Three dogs were in the back seat, one dead and another on the verge of death, and the third had survived. Martin was found barely alive in the passenger seat. X-rays indicated two fractured vertebrae and serious neck and back injuries. He would later tell police that Alan had become distracted by the dogs fighting in the back seat and lost control of the car. As Martin was the sole beneficiary of Helen Harvey's will, he inherited $550,000. After the death of his beloved friend, Martin moved back in with his family. His mood became worse and his behaviour became more disturbing. Three weeks after the death of Helen Harvey, Morris had secured his son's newfound wealth by a court order of the Mental Health Act. This would ensure that the inheritance would be paid out over the course of his life, rather than all at once. Later, Morris Bryant sought out help for his sudden depression and anxiety from the family GP. This was unusual for the usually outwardly confident family man. It was several months later, however, that Morris was found dead at the bottom of a dam with Martin's diving belt secured to his person. On the night he had vanished, Morris told his wife that he was going to spend the weekend in the farmhouse that Martin had inherited at Copping. He phoned his wife and his daughter that night and told them that he loved them. The next morning, a note was found at the house nailed to the front door that read, Call the police. Interestingly, before this event, Morris had secretly put his and his wife's joint bank accounts into Carlene's name alone and signed the bills for household utilities over to her. During the search for Morris, Martin was reportedly very excited to search for his missing father and was initially suspected by police to be his killer. He was later ruled out after an autopsy found a substantial amount of antidepressants in his system. Martin had now inherited his father's superannuation fund of $250,000. Without his father's gentle guidance and his best friend gone, Martin tried to fill the void by spending his inheritance on overseas adventures. Martin travelled all over the world from 1993 to 1995, later recounting that the best part of his trips were always the plane ride, when he could chat to the strangers who were forced to be seated next to him. Bryant's mood worsened, and he soon began to have darker thoughts. Later, he would state, quote, I had enough. I just felt more people were against me. When I tried to be friendly toward them, they just walked away, end quote. Bryant had never been more than a social drinker, but after his father's death, he began to drink excessively. Coupled with this was the fact that prior to his father's death, Morris Bryant had tried to purchase a bed and breakfast property called Seascape. According to Martin, his father had tried to purchase the B&B and was ultimately beat out by another couple, the Martins. Bryant blamed his father's depression and the following death on their purchase of the property, stating it was done out of spite. Bryant used at least some of the inheritance money to buy an AR-10 semi-automatic rifle through a Tasmania newspaper ad. He also attempted to find an AR-15 rifle in several other gun shops. At some unspecified point, Bryant was finally able to legally purchase an AR-15 along with an L1A1 self-loading battle rifle and a USAS-12 automatic shotgun. Early in 1996, Bryant visited the Port Arthur historic site and purchased a large sports bag big enough to carry a large amount of ammunition, devotedly measuring several bags before settling on one. On March 13, 1996, on the other side of the world, a 43-year-old suspected pedophile living in the Scottish town of Dunblane named Thomas Hamilton opened fire at the Dunblane Primary School, killing 16 children and one teacher before turning the gun on himself. Media coverage at the time assumed that this was the trigger for Bryant to act. The morning of April the 28th started off rather normal for the Bryants. 
Martin by this time had been in a steady relationship with his much younger girlfriend and she stayed the night with him at his family home. Martin's alarm clock rang out at 6am. Other family members and his girlfriend could not recall Martin ever needing the use of an alarm clock before this day. Two hours later, Martin's girlfriend leaves the Bryant residence to visit her parents. A short time after this, Bryant leaves the house, also taking with him a blue sports bag containing ammunition and a number of semi-automatic rifles. He loaded his gear into his yellow Volvo 244 GL sedan and began driving around town. Later on, he would purchase a bottle of tomato sauce, a cigarette lighter and a cup of coffee. He told numerous people that he was going surfing that day, despite the conditions being poor for the sport. At approximately 11.45am, Bryant arrives at Seascape Cottage, the B&B his father was unsuccessful in purchasing almost three years prior. It is here Bryant murders his first victims, David and Nolene Martin. Later this act was thought to be in retribution for his father not being able to purchase the cottage as Bryant would later state that he thought the couple bought the property out of spite and that they were nasty and mean people. Bryant would also blame his father's depression and subsequent death on the Martins. Before leaving Seascape, Bryant stole the Martins' weapons and keys and left the property sometime after the murders. At around 1 o'clock p.m., Bryant arrives at the Port Arthur historical site in his Volvo sedan and parks it. He then enters the Broad Arrow Cafe carrying a large blue duffel bag. About 60 to 70 people were inside enjoying their meals and wandering through the adjacent gift shop. Bryant orders some lunch, takes his food tray outside and casually eats his meal. According to witness accounts, Martin tries to start conversations with the other guests commenting on the amount of European wasps in the area and the lack of Japanese tourists. After finishing his meal, Bryant walked back inside the cafe, returned his tray, set down his sports bag, and pulled out his AR-15 rifle, opening fire on two Malaysian tourists, Mo Yi In and Sao Leng Chung. Both of them were killed instantly. Bryant then fired a shot at Mick's sergeant, grazing his scalp and knocking him to the floor. He then fatally shot sergeant's girlfriend, 21-year-old Kate Elizabeth Scott, hitting her in the back of the head. A 28-year-old New Zealand winemaker, Jason Winter, had been helping the busy cafe staff as Bryant turned towards Winter's wife, Joanne, and their 15-month-old son, Mitchell. Winter threw a serving tray at Bryant in an attempt to distract him. Joanne Winter's father pushed his daughter and grandson to the floor and under the table. 44-year-old Anthony Nightingale stood up after the sound of the first shots. Nightingale yelled, No, not here as Bryant pointed the weapon at him. As Nightingale leaned forward, he was fatally shot through the neck and spine. Bryant fired one shot that killed Kevin Vincent Sharp, and then fired another at Walter Bennett, which passed through his body and struck Raymond John Sharp, Kevin Sharp's brother, killing both. The three had their backs towards Bryant and were unaware what was happening. The shots were all at close range. Gerald Broom, Gay Fidley and her husband John were all struck by bullet fragments but survived. Bryant moved just a few metres and began shooting at the table where Graham Collier, Carolyn Lawton and her daughter Sarah were seated. Collier was shot in the jaw. Sarah Lawton ran towards her mother who had been moving between tables. Carolyn Lawton threw herself on top of her daughter. Bryant shot Carolyn Lawton in the back. Her eardrum was ruptured by the muzzle blast from the gun going off beside her ear. Despite Carolyn's efforts, Sarah had been fatally shot in the head. Bryant pivoted around and fatally shot Mervyn Howard. The bullet passed through him, through a window of the cafe, and hit a table outside on the balcony. Bryant then fatally shot Mervyn Howard's wife, Mary Howard, in the head and neck. Bryant was near the exit, preventing others from attempting to run past him and escape. Bryant moved across the cafe towards the gift shop area. As Bryant moved, Robert Elliott stood up. He was shot in the arm and head, though survived his injuries. All of these attacks inside the cafe took only 15 seconds. 12 people were killed and 10 were wounded. Bryant then moved into the gift shop where he continued his assault. Another eight people were left dead and two were wounded. Bryant then moves outside of the cafe and begins firing shots into the car park. 
Some tourists at the time believed this to be an historical reenactment. Another four people were killed and six were injured. At this point, Bryant then switches to the L1A1 SLR. Martin then heads for his Volvo sedan and drives to the exit of the historical site. It is here that Bryant sees a young mother and her two children. He stops his car next to them and holds them at gunpoint and kills all three as they attempt to flee. Bryant then re-enters his vehicle and heads toward the toll booth where he blocks off a gold BMW from entering the grounds. Briefly arguing with one of the car's occupants, as a result, Bryant murdered him, then the BMW's driver and two other occupants before transferring ammunition, a set of handcuffs, the AR-15 and the container of petrol he purchased into the BMW. After injuring an incoming motorist, Bryant then drove off in the BMW, leaving behind his Volvo, which still contained the USAS-12 shotgun and the rest of his rounds of ammunition. Another car drove up to the toll booth, which Bryant also shot at. Up the road, Bryant drives up to the service station at the Port Arthur General Store, where he encounters a white Toyota Corolla being driven by Glenn Piers and his girlfriend Zoe Hall in the passenger seat. Bryant cuts them off from the exit on the highway. He then quickly jumps out of his car with his rifle, murders Hall, takes Piers hostage, and forces him inside the boot of the BMW. Taking the BMW along with his hostage, Bryant then drives along the highway, heading back to Seascape Cottage. He encounters a few more vehicles that he fires at and injures at least four more people. One of the vehicles manages to escape to alert the police. Once back at Seascape Cottage, Bryant removes his hostage from the boot of the car and handcuffs him to the stair rail of the guest house where his first two victims were left lying on the ground. He then moved the contents of the BMW into the cottage and set fire to the car. At around 2.10 p.m., Bryant receives a call from TV station ABC Network calling local businesses in the area trying to confirm the shootings. Bryant fakes his identity and calls himself Jamie. He answered several questions but then quickly changed moods and threatened to kill his hostage if he was called again. Bryant then calls the local police station and refers to himself as Jamie once more. At 9pm, police began negotiations with Bryant, who was still referring to himself as Jamie. He demanded to be transported to a nearby airport in an army helicopter. The battery on his phone ran out, ending communication between the two parties. At some point during these negotiations, Piers was killed by his captor. The next morning, in a bizarre attempt to escape, Bryant starts a fire in the guest house and taunts police to capture him. In the mayhem, Bryant's clothes catch fire, causing burns to his back and buttocks. He runs toward the police after taking off his clothes and is subsequently arrested. Martin Bryant is then taken to the Royal Hobart Hospital where he is treated and placed under armed guard and heavy surveillance. The remains of the Martins and Piers were found shortly afterwards. Kidnapped. Kidnapped. When you How did this guy get to get in the boot? I put him in the boot because I had the gun. Which gun did you have? I had the um, Mr. Warren Holder. AR-15. See, if people didn't do this unfortunate things, you guys wouldn't have a job. Well, there's a lot of truth in that, man. Let me tell you. In the immediate aftermath of the massacre. A lot of questions were being raised as to who the perpetrator was and why did they do it. I understand he may have done. <sighs> Kill lots of people. Any idea why? No, no idea. Any idea who he was? No, no idea. Not a local, I don't think. Australian media was heavily criticised for journalistic practices following the tragedy, some going as far as to manipulate photos of Bryant to make him appear more menacing. The Hobart Mercury even posted a photo of Bryant on the front page with the headline, This is the man. This was all before Bryant had stood in trial. During interviews with police, Martin Bryant describes from his own point of view the killings that took place. These interviews were recorded and showed a person who either lacked intelligence or suffered from a personality disorder. Sorry, this <laughs> so if you held a gun, you would pull the trigger with your uh, finger on your left hand? Yeah, that's right. All right. And uh, did you ever practice shooting from the hip? 
In his descriptions, one can quite clearly see the lack of understanding that Bryant has for his actions. Martin was assessed by a court-appointed psychiatrist who found him to be most likely afflicted with several mood and personality disorders. On top of that, it was also noted that Bryant was likely to have ADHD and showing autistic traits, in particular Asperger's syndrome. Another psychiatrist also evaluated Bryant and found him to be borderline mentally disabled with an IQ of 66, equivalent to that of an 11-year-old. Bryant, however, was judged fit to stand trial, which was scheduled to begin on the 7th of November 1996. He initially pleaded not guilty, but was persuaded by his court-appointed lawyer, John Avery, to plead guilty to all charges. Bryant gave differing reasons for his actions on the day of the massacre, stating that it was because the Martins buying the property, or it was perhaps revenge for the cafe, not allowing him to sell items outside of the cafe when he was nine years old. Two weeks later, Hobart Supreme Court Judge William Cox gave Bryant 35 life sentences, plus 1,652 years in prison, without the possibility of parole, all of which is to be served concurrently. This life sentence being applied is for the term of his natural life. Bryant is notable as the first person in Australian history to be given life imprisonment without parole. Bryant was put into a specially built cell in a solitary confinement unit in the prison. During his incarceration, he attempted suicide a total of eight times, the most recent attempt occurring on March the 27th, 2007. Today, he remains in maximum security at Risdon Prison, near Hobart. The massacre sparked serious debate amongst Australians surrounding the use of firearms in the country, in particular, the right to own and use automatic weapons. I will not retreat an inch from the national responsibilities I have in relation to this whole issue. Not an inch. Other gun critics want to go even further than just controlling one sector of the weapons market. No problem with all the states having the same gun laws. What I do have a problem is with the government in Canberra trying to take control of those things which are at the moment the rights of the sovereign states. The Australian government had banned the importation of rapid firing military style guns in 1991, but a lot of them still remain in circulation throughout the country. Tasmania was noted as having the most relaxed gun laws in Australia, providing a potential situation for such a tragedy to take place. In the few weeks after the massacre, Prime Minister John Howard implemented critical changes to gun safety legislation, with bipartisan state, territory and Commonwealth support. The endorsement offered by Coalition partner and Nationals leader Tim Fisher and Labor's Kim Beasley, leader of the opposition, was crucial to achieving the reforms. The government introduced the buyback scheme, which saw over 640,000 firearms returned and destroyed at a cost of the government of $350 million. The new gun laws were possibly the cause of some conspiracy theories surrounding the event, but I might save that for another video. The Port Arthur massacre is arguably the worst tragedy in Australian history, and we should never forget the lives of the victims who were taken that day. A total of 35 souls were tragically taken. As horrific as it was, I do feel it is important to remember those lost on Australia's darkest day. Rest in peace.